Hello everyone, welcome again. So today's lesson will be on the chemical earth um, module in year 11 chemistry. And in the previous lesson we looked at covalent substances and in today's lesson we're going to look at a comparison of all the different types of bonding that we've seen, covalent, ionic and metallic. And we're going to see how they're different, how they're the same and what properties each of them has um, that make them useful. Okay. So you can see here um, on the very left hand side is something like a metallic bond. Um, lots of big nuclei sitting next to each other and something in between. Um, here we have um, on the, to the right of that we have the, um, a molecular substance. You can see the little ball and stick model. And here we have something that looks resembles an ionic substance. Alternating blue and red. Okay? So we're going to see how each of those fits in um, in this lesson. Okay, so first things first, metallic substances. So we form metallic substances by the attraction between the positive metal ions, so these guys, the nuclei, um, and the negatively charged delocalized electrons, which are these blue minus signs. Okay? The delocalized electrons give excellent electrical conductivity because they're free to move around all the way throughout the lattice. Okay? Um, they have high melting and boiling points because the force of attraction is actually very, very large. So this um, attraction between the positive and negative um, charges has actually a very large value and that means that the melting and boiling point will be very high because it takes a lot of energy to separate all of those bonds. Okay? And it has an excellent thermal conductivity because each of those nuclei are very close together so they can bump into each other and spread vibrations. And also the electrons, which can be excited by thermal energy, can actually go and strike other nuclei and make them um, vibrate also. Okay? So it helps to increase the thermal conductivity of that substance. So now ionic substances. It's formed when metal atoms donate their electrons to non-metal atoms. Okay? So one forms a positive ion and the other forms a negative ion. Okay? As I said, positive and negative ions are formed, which are bonded together through electrostatic attraction. So this one is attracted to this one, and is, this one is also attracted to this one. And that's by the same kind of, uh, it's analogous, or very similar to, the way north and south poles of a magnet are attracted to one another. Oppositely charged things attract one another. Okay? And that's what's happening here. Right? The resulting substance is very hard and brittle, because um, it's very hard because there's a very strong force of attraction and it's brittle because certain defects can actually propagate through very quickly. They have very, very high melting and boiling points and that's because of that very strong attraction as I mentioned. That high boiling point and melting point is related to the very strong bonds between positive and negative charges. Okay? Now, you'd be surprised by the fact that even though there's so much charge here, they're actually a poor conductor of electricity in solid state. Okay, so in the solid crystal form, these ionic substances are very poor conductors. But if you can separate them, um, either as a molten or aqueous, um, in either molten or aqueous state, the substance can conduct electricity very well. Okay. okay. So moving on to covalent molecular substances formed through the sharing of electrons between atoms. So the covalent bond is formed by the sharing of electrons, resulting in an ensemble of discrete particles called molecules. Okay? So we result in an ensemble of discrete elements or discrete things that we call molecules. So these guys are all called molecules. Covalent molecular substances have very low and boiling and melting points because the, the attraction between these molecules is practically zero. Okay? Each of those is free to move around by themselves, so they can go bouncing around and being free. They have poor electrical conductivity and usually occur in gas phase. So the poor electrical conductivity comes from the fact that all of these are electrically neutral. So even if they are moving, there's no charge, so they don't really conduct electricity. And there are no free electrons, because they're all locked up in these covalent bonds. Okay? 
Now, the reason why they're gas is because the bonds between them are so weak that very little energy uh, makes them go flying off in all different directions, which is exactly what a gas does. And so they, put, they act like gases when there's very little energy input. Okay? So we've talked about covalent molecular substances now. So we're going to talk about covalent network substances. So this looks like a scary image, but really all it is is just at each of the corners is a carbon atom. So just imagine there's lots and lots of carbons all stuck together. Okay? But again, covalent network substances are formed by the sharing of electrons. But instead of forming discrete molecules, like in the molecular case, atoms bond with adjacent atoms to form like a grid or a network. So, they, so each of these carbons bonds to all of its adjacent carbons to give a bit of a network structure rather than little molecules that are free to move by themselves. These substances have extremely high melting and boiling points and poor electrical conductivity. So the high melting point and boiling point comes because each of these bonds is very hard to break. Um, and there's millions and millions of them. So in order to separate the elements in such a way that they're free to move, you would have to break thousands upon thousands of bonds, um, which are all quite strong. And again, like the molecular case, all of the electrons are all stuck in these bonds. So because they're all stuck in these bonds, they can't conduct electricity, so you don't have electrical conductivity. Okay? Generally, because of the way the bond structure works and the fact that they don't want to interact with other chemicals outside of their bonding, because all of their electron shells are full, they're generally insoluble in water and many other solvents. Okay? So not many solvents can dissolve these covalent network substances. Okay. So that concludes today's lesson on a comparison of the different bonding types. We looked at metallic, covalent molecular, ionic, and covalent network substances and their properties and why those properties occur that way. Okay? So we'll move on to the question segment now and hopefully you'll be able to um, utilize this knowledge to answer some questions. So identify the physical properties used to classify compounds as ionic, covalent, or molecular, or covalent network. Melting boiling points, that's one. Obviously, covalent network and ionic have different boiling points. Um, so if you find a very low substance that has a very low melting and boiling point, you would pretty much assume that it's covalent molecular. Electrical conductivity. So if I could dissolve it and conduct electricity, then it's ionic. And neither of these two conduct at all. And hardness. So obviously covalent network is harder than covalent molecular, etc. Student needs to determine what bonding exists in a substance. The substance is crystalline at room temperature, has a high melting point, and is a poor electrical conductor in solid state. What are the likely bonding types that this substance could have? So there's more than one. So it could be either ionic or covalent network. It's hard or crystalline. It's got a high melting point, which is both ionic and covalent network. And it's a poor electrical conductor, Okay, so in solid state. So we don't know which one it is. It's one of these two. What tests could be done to determine if the substance is ionic or covalent network? You could attempt to dissolve the substances in water. The ionic substance will be the substance that dissolves in the water. Okay, so that's one. Okay, you could try and dissolve it, and if it does dissolve, you know it's ionic. But you know that covalent network substances will likely not dissolve in water at all. Okay. The covalent bonds between atoms in a network structure are not extremely strong. If this is true, explain why network structures have extremely high melting points. Okay, so I'm saying here that each covalent bond is very weak or not very strong in a covalent network substance. But we know that covalent network substances have extremely high melting points. So why is that? So in order to achieve the molten state, um, the atoms need to be mobile. Okay? This requires the breaking of all the bonds in the substance. Since a huge number of bonds are present in any network structure, the relatively low energy needed to break a single bond is offset by the huge number of bonds that needs to be broken. Okay? So while one bond may be weak, having to break a million weak bonds is still going to take a lot of energy. So that's essentially what's going on here. 
you have a lot of weak bonds holding the thing together. So you have to break each and every one of them in order to achieve the molten or liquid state. Okay? And that's why they have high melting points because there's so many bonds that need to be broken. And so that's, um, and even though each of those bonds is very weak, you still need to break all of those bonds. Describe one use for covalent molecular substances that you can be using them as insulators. Polymers and rubbers are covalent molecular substances that are often used to insulate electrical wires. That's one major use for them, okay, as insulators. Explain why covalent molecular substances are poor conductors of heat. So we, look, we may not have covered this fully, um, but hopefully we can cover it now. So in order to transfer heat, molecules or particles need to interact with one another. Since the molecules in a covalent molecular substance are widely spaced and moving at random, the chances of particles interacting with one another is very low. Therefore, the heat transfer through a covalent molecular substance is also very low because they don't, the particles don't really want to interact with one another and so they don't want to spread that heat. Um, or it takes much longer for them to spread that heat because they simply can't interact with one another as quickly as an ionic covalent molecular, a covalent network or metallic substance. Okay. So that concludes today's lesson on the different bonding types. We looked at the four major bonding types and we described each of their properties and how we can identify them based on these properties. So the next lesson we'll look at some common covalent molecular substances and hopefully you'll be able to learn something about our everyday world. So I look forward to seeing you at our next lesson.